When I was a teenager, I had a best friend. This was before people started using the term BFF, but that's what we were. We met at church, we bonded in Sunday school, and then we grew inseparable during junior high. We stayed over at each other's houses and borrowed each other's makeup and had matching two peas in a pod necklaces, and people called us Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and we were inseparable. Until suddenly, we weren't. I was very the play-by-play, -play, but a series of minor slights and petty conflicts spiraled out of control until we were in what seemed to us one of the great dramas of the century. We were like 14, so, you know, it's hard for the course. Eventually, we were no longer speaking with one another. The friendship was over, but we'd met and formed our friendship at church, and our falling out had happened in full view of the church, and we still attended the same Sunday school classes and youth group meetings and church social events. And so my youth pastor endeavored to help us embody the Christian virtues of forgiveness and reconciliation that Jesus touches on in today's Gospel reading. This Lent, we've been focusing on the story of Peter, perhaps the foremost, the leader of the disciples, as he follows Jesus. And in today's reading, he's with Jesus in Capernaum, where Jesus is teaching before starting his journey to Jerusalem, where he will face trial and crucifixion, death and resurrection. In his teaching about forgiveness, Jesus offers this sequential approach to dealing with any kind of grievance. First, he says, handle it directly. If a brother sins against you, Jesus says, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. The word brother there is translated as church member, in, I think, in our Bibles, um, because it was customary at those times for early Christians to use the language of kinship to describe their relationship uh, with each other. This is an unusual or counterintuitive advice, but people have always found it challenging. It is much easier to write about someone than to talk to them. So that's where Jesus asks his followers to start. If that doesn't work, Jesus says, take two or three people with you. Only after you've attempted to resolve the dispute directly is it appropriate to start involving other people, he says, and only a few people at that. And finally, if even that does not work, Jesus says, you can bring the matter to the church as a whole. Of course, it's hard to imagine a contemporary congregation following these steps to the letter. I don't really think that it would be helpful or appropriate if we had some interpersonal conflict among two of you, two of us, to have them, you know, to have folks come up here during Sunday service and hash it out. Uh, but the principal undergirds are denominational structures for addressing conflicts and grievances. When a conflict can't be resolved interpersonally, there are mediation teams and uh, denominational committees um, that step in to facilitate, to be in that role of bringing it to the church to help resolve the issue. Uh, that's one of, I'm, I'm going to be part of the church in a couple such meetings uh, in the near future, actually. Even if the exact steps, quite the way Jesus describes them here, don't still fit exactly with our modern context, we can see here yeah, well, I mean, that Jesus maybe is... Maybe that's helped oh. it or not. Oh. Linda and Ned, you're unmuting intermittently. Are you hearing okay? Uh, yeah, we, th I, we just keep getting uh, cut out, so we're trying, Ooh, okay. sorry. Gotcha. All right. Jesus urges us not to throw away a relationship lightly. We are called to be tenacious in our commitment and love for one another. In this age of 
block buttons and call screenings, call screening, it can be easy to write another person off, to end a relationship rather than attempt to heal it. It can be easy to nurse a grudge until a person who used to be dear becomes somebody you used to. But God calls us to something better. We are urged, especially in spiritual community, to do the hard work of staying in relationship, to be honest, vulnerable, and direct with one another, both because our relationships are valuable and because hearing that we have erred, that we have hurt someone, is an opportunity for us to grow and to do better next time. Jesus teaches about this, and then Peter follows up with a question. How many times should I forgive? Seven times? Seven is a number that suggests completeness and wholeness, like the seven days in the creation story that become the seven days of the week. Peter is suggesting that we forgive an extravagant number of times. But Jesus replies, not seven, but 77, or 70 times seven, 490, depending on how you translate it. He's agreeing with Peter and going a step further. Forgiveness should be even beyond the abundance that Peter is suggesting. Of course, it's one thing to talk about this and another thing entirely to live it. And when we're talking about it, we tend to imagine ourselves as the ones doing the forgiving. We ponder what it means to live a life of forgiveness and how to cultivate that kind of spirit. We reflect on the fine line between forgiving transgressions and accepting mistreatment. One is something that we're called to and the other is really not. For Peter, he wants to learn to sit at Jesus' feet and hear the teachings. But we who know the old story know what's going to happen next with Jesus and Peter in the chapters to come. Peter will deny that he even knows Jesus three times. He will turn tail and run to protect himself, leaving Jesus in his hour of need. And then after the miracle of Easter morning, Peter, who wanted to know how many times he should forgive, will be not the one who forgives, but the one who receives complete and abundant forgiveness. Today's bulletin cover is a reflection on this teaching. Hold it up in case you want to have a reflection on food. So, it's a mandala, a mandala. A it's a traditional style of art that originates with Eastern religions and is associated with spirituality and meditation. The artist, Lauren Wright Pittman, offers this explanation of the piece. In this mandala, I wanted to follow a person through the process of approval, forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration, as Jesus describes in Matthew 18. In the center is a person standing alone, isolated, with their arms crossed in a closed-off posture. If you're sinned against, Jesus says to go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. When you move to the second ring of the mandala, there are pairs of people shaking hands, finding common ground, or at least attempting to. If this doesn't work, then you're to bring more people, one or two more together, to provide counsel and witness. So in the third ring of the mandala, two people are engaging with the closed off person, sharing a way forward. In the next ring, Hyacinth flowers, which represent sorrow, regret, and forgiveness, stretch, bloom, and grow, bringing beauty into the now open arms of the people in the last outer ring of the mandala, who are embraced and woven into the community. The person from the center goes from being alone and closed off to embraced and open. This piece contains 77 people and flowers to represent the abundance of grace that Jesus calls us into. So that's the, the thinking behind this visual representation of the scripture today. 
Jesus acknowledges that sometimes people will not be able to reach resolution, as indeed my teenage best friend and I were not able to. If it's not possible, he says, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. If we're not listening carefully, we might imagine that Jesus says, if a relationship cannot be salvaged, then let it go. Perhaps we might think of another saying of Jesus, shake the dust off your sandals, he said, about places that don't want to hear the word of God. We might think of him as saying, repudiate the person and the relationship, walking, walk away knowing that you've done all you can. But that's not quite what he says. Let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What do we know in scripture? about how Jesus thinks about Gentiles and tax collectors. Maybe you remember some stories about how Jesus treated Gentiles. His ministry was, of course, primarily to his own community, which was Jewish. But he did reach beyond his religious and cultural identity. He cast demons out of a possessed man in the land of the Gerasenes. He healed the servant of a Roman centurion. He shared water and good news with the Samaritan woman at the well. There are many stories of Jesus' ministry to and companionship with Gentiles. And as for tax collectors, maybe you remember the story of Zacchaeus, the despised tax collector who climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus better from a distance and ended up welcoming Jesus into his home, repenting and making amends for those he had defrauded. Let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, Jesus says, which is to say, let such a one be to you as a child of God. Remember that they are created in God's image, loved beyond words, called to repentance by the God who will never give up. Let such a one with whom you cannot reconcile be to you as a lost sheep whom God is seeking, even if you cannot anymore. Because that is who we all are to God. Beloved ones, who sometimes sit at Jesus' feet longing to learn and sometimes deny that we even know him. Who sometimes shine God's light in the world and sometimes stumble in the darkness. Who stubbornly resist making things right sometimes. Faithful disciples and wandering hearts, who one day, sooner or later, by grace and the Holy Spirit, may return home to the God who welcomes us with open arms. Thanks be to God. Amen.